Welcome to episode 113 of Destination Linux. This is a podcast of opinions made up of four of the greatest minds ever discussing our passion for Linux. I'm Ryan, with, and with me today are three podcasting champions. We have Noah. How are you, sir? I am excellent. That's Zeb, how are like you? Respond when you say champions. Feeling much better now, thank you. And Michael, how have you been, sir? Excelsior. So, Noah, you're back. We missed you last week. What have you yeah. been up to? Well, I'm up, so that's a, that's a start in the right direction. No, I uh, I was at scale. and uh -huh. um, Did you get enough sleep while you are at scale? So here's the thing, Ryan. At scale, <laughs> I had a number of things going on. I had a number of things affecting my well-being. That, so I was on a time change, so that's strike one. Uh -huh. Strike two, it was the weekend of daylight savings time. That's strike two. Strike three. As you might imagine, I'd not really slept at all the past couple of nights because scale. That's strike three. And then strike four was I learned something interesting about technology. Uh, I learned that uh, unlike, the, and everybody tells me this is different with iPhones, so I apologize. You probably have not experienced this if you have an iPhone, but on Android anyway, if you don't plug your phone in to charge and the battery goes to 0% and the phone mm -hmm. turns off, then the alarms don't fight. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so when you are dealing with 48 hours of sleep deprivation leading up to that, you don't plug your phone in, uh, then you oversleep. And we don't then, have that problem on Apple. You want to know why? Right. Yeah. Uh, you get a dongle, I'm sure you're and then you me. have a giant battery oh, right. connect to the yes, dongle, dongle, and it right. just swings <laughs> around. Of course. And make sure you have plenty of, of space. Course. Yeah, but hang on a minute. If the iPhone runs out of battery, <laughs> it runs out of battery. It can't ring. No, no it's still the alarm. It's, apparently, I'm told that yeah. the iPhone, Zeb, still goes off, okay? What? Yeah. Does it have a 2% buffer that it only uses Listen, Robert, for alarm? The iPhone... <laughs> <laughs> the iPhone does not is not subject to these artificial limitations that these goofy silly Android phones are subject to. Okay? Yeah, like physics. Yeah. Finally, right. you guys are learning. So you're telling me then that if my wife sets an alarm but she turns her iPhone off, the alarm will still go. Of yes. course, because it's an iPhone. But here's here's what you have to understand. You have to understand that iPhone people they're not fanatics. They're not fanboys. Mm -hmm. Okay, Never. that's nothing at all. But really? the batteries don't die in them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you wouldn't have had that problem uh, if you had an iPhone. So when when you get your new iPhone, no? Yeah, it's uh, on order. It's uh, I, I I went ahead and bought it from the Apple Store for seventeen hundred dollars and ninety nine cents plus well, my you first got it one. On sale. That's a deal, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, so they're gonna go ahead and ship that to me, and then uh, I spent another seven hundred dollars on cases and accessories. So uh, it should be a good time. I mean, I won't eat for the next three months, but hey, at least I have a stupid glowing iPhone. Hey, you know the problem though with that seven hundred dollars is there's no way you got dongles with that, so you're gonna no have to spend no, some and it was it was dongle. all the cheap knockoff uh, <laughs> knockoff accessories too. You know the real stuff with the half eaten apple; those were a little bit more, but I couldn't afford that so well awesome well i'm glad you're finally seeing the light we'll be yeah, coming to iphone zeb how has your week been sir you were sick last week everybody was asking in the comments how you were doing so how are you feeling this week well i spent the i spent that week getting better so i am much much better thank you very much indeed um so much better in fact that i was able to go to the ubuntu podcast meeting yesterday uh, nice. in reading and I met up with uh, Popey and um, Wimpress. Oh, we don't name him on this show. Oh, of course. Yeah, sorry. So I met up with Popey and he who should never be RTFM'd. Um, <laughs> and it was great. It was great to meet him and just speak to him and just chat about this and that and the other. And there was some really nice other people there as well who are supporters of the podcast. So I guess there was about 22 people there. Um, and a great time was had by all. And I left early. I thought I'll get a couple of hours kit, I'll appear on Biddle, and I woke up at 5 a.m. Because mm. wow. I had been consuming alcohol since 1 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, a sounds, good like, idea. sounds like a fantastic time, and I assumed you got lots of Linux talk in there and learned all kinds of cool we things. We certainly did. It was fantastic. And do you know the really thing that bugged me? What's that? I forgot to take the DL stickers with me. Oh, man. We could have put them so all over Popey's car. <laughs> I thought you were going to say all over Popey's face. It's just like, just like he, came by he came by train, so yeah, that would have been difficult. But yeah, no, we'll do that for next time. I'll take I'll take some stickers along. Perfect. And Michael, what kind of trouble you've been getting into this week? Interesting, you said trouble. Yeah, because it's very accurate. Unfortunately, wow. I dropped my phone for the first time ever. That doesn't happen with iPhone. That's true. 
That's true. Explode. Physics. Physi- it, defies, it defies physics. That's true. Yeah. Uh, but I dropped the phone, and it was just like a two-foot drop or something, and the case was on it, so no breakage. Glass is fine. The structure is fine. LCD decided to break, though. So oh, it's yeah. uh, it's it looks fine when it's off, but it's completely broken. However, because of that, I had I, I had decided to try out some new things, and that would be uh, Ubuntu Touch. Yeah. Is what I'm currently Ooh. running on a, a spare phone that I had that was uh, a, a friend's a friend's phone that was given to me from a local Linux user group to try out Ubuntu Touch, and then I tried it out for a little bit, and it's it's interesting, and then I, but I never really fully tried it, so. I decided, well, I don't have a phone anymore now. Might as well give it a shot. So now I'm running uh, Ubuntu Touch as my primary uh, interface for my phone, and it's and I'm going to be doing like a 30-day challenge, kind of similar to how Ryan got started with Linux. So nice. we'll see if this outcome is similar or if I go back to Lineage or something. But we'll see. And what phone have you put it on? Uh, OnePlus One. It's actually... So you're not worried about Chinese infiltrations with their chips giving away information and stuff? Uh, no, because I mean, one plus uh, Huawei. Yeah, that's this Huawei. Yeah, the, I think the one plus one is. Yeah, one plus is a yeah, is a separate thing from the same continent. Isn't well, it? I mean, literally every phone is made in China, basically. <laughs> so it's like, what 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 what's, what can you do? But I think this is actually really cool because it's it's like a five year old phone, but it's ridiculously powerful for how old it is. Mm-hmm. And then you look at the current one plus devices, and they're just absurdly powerful. Like. They yeah. they have like specs that would can be compared to a desktop or a laptop or wow. like it's it's absurd. But uh, that's that's great because it means that this really old phone that is a one of the like the flagship supported devices of Ubuntu, of Ubuntu Touch works quite well and is still a usable phone. So so far I've done some testing and it is, you know, it actually works pretty well for you know the, the, based on like the how long it's been around. So I will be doing some videos about that pretty soon. Uh, more than likely, I will be doing them. I can't really guarantee them. If you look I at my track awesome. record, I think that's awesome. The Ubuntu Touch development team and the community around it is are super passionate about the project, and they do a fantastic job. Oh yeah. Uh, overall, there are things that you want to see, but you can, you know, and we, you tested it. We made a call earlier in the week. It was perfectly clear. I had no idea. I mean, obviously, you're on uh, any other device, but there are some apps that you know you would like to see some improvements on or we, that I've also noticed when I was using mine. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, when you think about how far they've come with that device so far, it's just, it's an incredible achievement on their part. And I think it's a fantastic product. And we joke about the Apple and Android thing, but personally I would much rather run Ubuntu touch permanently and not touch either of those devices. Yeah. You know, it's kind of nice too, is the, the, the community picked it back up after, after it didn't have any commercial backing, right? Which is mm-hmm. something that, you know they took a real risk on that, so good on them. And they've they've actually upgraded it to the, so they they have newer versions of the software, and it works it works surprisingly well. And uh, I am looking forward to doing the the testing. So yeah. for this next uh, month or so, I'll be trying out a bunch of touch, and I'll make some videos about it. And uh, yeah, we'll see how well, it goes. That's cool because your your next thirty day challenge will be can I get those videos published? <laughs> Well, wow. that's that. I think that will be a part of the next uh, six months challenge, yeah. really, because that's that's I my love, usual. I track love record. how nobody can troll Michael because Michael will out troll himself. Good luck. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> troll me. Exactly. Well, well, it's whatever, also because I'm like I'm making this new video question. three weeks later. I'll, I'm still making that video, so I, it's 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 a troll, but it's also accurate, so it doesn't really bother me. It's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Uh, one other thing I just wanted to uh, to throw in there, I, um, I went at scale. I had the opportunity to meet up with the Facebook Open Compute Project. And so the Open Compute Project, if you're not familiar with it, is a new way to build a server. And essentially, the rack becomes the housing of the server. And each component of the rack then goes, it becomes a component of that server. So, for example, instead of having a server as in a 1U thing that slides in, each sled you might have a storage sled that just has hard drives, another compute sled that just has processors, another uh, GPU sled that just has graphics cards in it. And uh, and then the rack itself is actually powered with a rail at the back. And so hmm. this entire thing boots up as a computer. And I've been trying for four years to get 
uh, this whole thing on camera so that we could release a video about it. And uh, this year I just refused to take no for an answer. And so we'll have a link for that in the show notes, uh, but you should check it out because it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I personally believe this is the way that large scale computing is going to go. So if you want to, and it's all being done with open hardware, it's all being done with open hardware and the open BMC wow. controller allows all of these components to talk to one another, all with open code. It's a really cool project and it is getting a lot of uh, momentum. Facebook is using it in all of their data centers uh, Amazon and Google are looking at it. So it, it, I think that's going to be the future of servers. Surely that's also going to mitigate the problems that you get sometimes in these server farms of excessive heat because you have all of these components sure. enclosed in a box where now they're just going to be open on a, on a rack. Well, they're more and they're more efficient, right? Like the idea is that, you know, you might have Facebook might need a lot of processing power and graphics power because people are uploading a lot of pictures and videos and they need a lot of storage power. But then you have... Amazon, for example, they don't necessarily process a lot of graphics on their on their shopping site. They just need a lot of database power, right? Uh, and so you can build one rack one way for one data center and build a rack completely mm-hmm. a separate way for a different data center. So there's there's so much it's so much more efficient. Excellent. Very cool. Well, I look forward to watching that. So this episode of Destination Linux is sponsored by our friends at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. You can get all this plus access to the world-class customer support for as low as $5 per, per month or you can use their flexible pricing structure for as low as 0.7 cent per hour, and that's darn near free. DigitalOcean also has 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. Get started on DigitalOcean for two months free with $100 credit by going to do.co slash dl. You can use that $100 credit to try out a bunch of their small droplets or some of their beefy droplets. If you want, you can even test run their beefy 16 gigabyte of RAM, six CPU droplet that has six terabytes total of transfer. Again, you can get started at DigitalOcean with $100 credit by going to do.co slash DL. So this week, I dropped a new server. It was a CloudRon server. So CloudRon was really interesting. I'd never played with it before. I ran on an article, uh, ran across an article of it. And essentially for experienced folks like maybe Michael and Noah, they may look at this and go, heck, I can drop my own, you know, droplet and server and etherpad and all this in seconds anyway. So I don't need to do this. But what CloudRon does is it allows you to basically one click, think about the marketplace for DigitalOcean. In fact, CloudRun's in the marketplace where you choose what kind of droplet you want. You choose CloudRun, boom, it drops it. And then you say you want Etherpad. Instead of having to go through the whole process of setting up all the server database, it's one click in CloudRun. Then you want also another, and it does it by like apps in an app store. Let's say you want uh, NextCloud, you one click, boom, you've got NextCloud set up. It's Everything's one click. It's all administered through this one app. Now, you only get two apps free. After that, they want you to pay a monthly cost uh, in there to add additional apps that you want it to manage, but you can do all this on a single droplet if you want. Wow. It's really kind of a cool mm-hmm. process to play with and one of the ways that we're testing out moving to Etherpad ourselves. Yeah, I think uh, Cal- Caltron is a really cool uh, service for managing applications, uh, for self-hosted applications. There's like it's kind of expensive if you think about it, but overall it is a very convenient. Like if you've ever tried to do self hosting, when you try to install software, it's typically very annoying and painful. Um, when if depending on the the infrastructure of that particular mm-hmm. software, because some software is really easy and it takes like you just upload sure. the files and just click the install button. Like WordPress, it's really easy to update and install and stuff. But there's other ones that are just ridiculous, and you have to like get the certain type of the source code from the specific Git repo. You have to clone it onto your server and all this other stuff. And CloudRun makes it a lot easier. You just click a button, says okay, install. When there's a new version. Just click okay, update. And it makes it so much easier. And that's really cool. Uh, I wish it was a little bit less expensive, but overall, it's still a good software. And uh, if you were looking to do self-hosted in an easier way, it's pretty good. Yep. Can somebody explain to me, and I think probably Noah, because you've just talked about these Facebook servers and all the rest of it, what exactly do the load balancers do? And why would they be important to a given type of, of business sort of thing? So let's say you go and 
make a request to a website, you want to go to google.com and everybody is going to go to google.com. And so there's a IP address associated with google.com. Eventually that web server gets full, right? And so we mm -hmm. put up a second web server, but we need everybody to go to google.com. And then we need google.com to decide to hand traffic off to one computer or another computer, or in the case of google.com, thousands of computers, because you have to mm -hmm. be able to simultaneously serve requests. So load balancer, essentially what it does is it balances the traffic load across a, a data set. Now, uh, and, right. and yeah, so that, that's essentially what it does. Nice. nice, thank you. All right, so before we get into our email, we want to give a special thanks to everyone who has supported the GoFundMe page to bring Zeb to America. You have raised $1,426 of the $2,000 goal. That is incredible. The page is still up if you want to help Zeb and the rest of the crew all together at South, get Zeb and the rest of the crew all together at Southeast Linux Fest this year. We are going to have such an awesome time. I am so excited to be able to hang out with Zeb and Michael and Noah all in one place. And we really hope you all will be able to, and we've, I've actually gotten messages, a lot of people who've never been to Self before. I think this has inspired them to go. I mean, this would be a great time if you've never gone to self and you get to hang out with the Destination Linux crew. And if you've mm -hmm. never been before, basically around lunchtime, make your way around Noah's table because he'll have a booth set up. <laughs> and then you'll see a line of, I don't know, 50, 60 people asking Noah where he's going to lunch and then following him to whatever lunch place there is. And you can eat with the crew too, but it's an absolute blast. And Everybody if any restaurants are interested in getting sponsorships, so we can actually push these crowds to your thing. Let us give us, give us, give us a comment. Uh, <laughs> comments at destinationlinks.org. Yeah. It's, it's like there's conversations around lunchtime in little groups. Anybody know where Noah's going? Where's Noah going? Where's Noah going? Where's Noah going? Then we find out the place and they all head there. One, one, one time, Noah, you should just head to a different restaurant and see everybody freak out. No, I couldn't. I couldn't do that. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't upset all my fans, Ryan. I couldn't yeah. upset all my fans. I have to deliver, you know? Yeah. Well, no, but it, it's just a ton of fun. Yeah. And one of the things that I hope to be able to do this year as well is start streaming some oh, look at videos you. Oh, nice. on my phone. So we're going to have a play with that. I'm going to have a workout before we get there, how it all works. Because at the moment, you just stick it in and it's like... Yeah, this is interesting. What do I do now? So I'm going to be playing with that, playing with my phone and see what we Wait, can do. Wait, are you going to try to have competing streams against me? Because I have a gimbal here to live stream you too. We can have a gimbal is shoot that. You were off. <laughs> what if you like, battle? you just start recording each other and it's like, it's a weird, and like, but, but you you set up your, their monitors to do like an infinite effect. All everyone's going to see is Zeb or my. Except what we'll have then you see is we'll have Zeb in color and everything else in black and white. Yeah, there you go. Because nice. that's what my video I can apparently I have no idea how to turn it on, but hey, <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Zeb oh, now in Zeb. Technicolor. So that Zeb is just a silhouette and everything else can be seen. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Robert. Like it. I'm sure I will. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get to our email. Email writes in and says, guys, I'm a recent retiree near 40 year in a near 40 year in IT now living in New Hampshire. I've been a Linux enthusiast for quite some time, and I finally have some time to play with Linux and software development as a hobby. I learned of your podcast through Michael's Twill podcast, which is not so awesome. And ha no, I'm just kidding. It's just, which is awesome. HC said it's amazing. It's the best yeah, podcast yeah. ever. That's he, not he what did. he said either. But. He said yeah, it was awesome. Was and he said he actually listened to that one before this one. And have become a huge fan of Destination Linux. As a retiree, I'm working within a budget. But I already have my Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, and I've contributed to getting Zeb to self. Nice. I've ordered a Destination Linux coffee mug. Fellow listeners, take notice. You can help out too. I hope my small contributions help keep you guys going. They do, especially the coffee. <laughs> I love the show and look forward to it every single week. You have an awesome crew and the various personalities of your team work great together and resonate deeply with me. Long ago, I fancied myself a technically brilliant as Michael. Spent a did you write this, Michael? I did not write this. There's a lot of, I did a lot not. of really positive sending notes things. in about himself. This guy, this guy must be new. He doesn't know that we don't talk about Michael in a positive manner yeah. like this. I fancied <laughs> myself as technically brilliant as Michael, spent a great deal of my career as an IT product program manager, perhaps like Noah, and managed one of my close friends as an IT project manager who could be a doppelganger of Ryan and, as you might expect, Ryan to claim, after sending a link to one of your podcasts to my friends, he said, oh, I'm smarter than that guy. No, you're not. Buddy. He's a, he's a big Alabama football fan. Not sure about Ryan, but maybe they share a thing. Don't know. 
Is that wow. that thing where you take a bat and you hit one of the small balls and you get a field goal? Uh, I think this is that's the one where you kick the ball and it like flies through the air and then somebody tries to block the ball from getting into the uh, basket. And oh. The receiver. oh, soccer. Roll Tide. <laughs> while my career, I had while in my while during my career, I had a diverse and brilliant team of software engineers and project managers like Michael, Noah, and yes, even Ryan that made me successful. I am sure my team viewed me as more of a Zeb, and and Zeb as I was the one who ran the show. You should consider that a compliment, Zeb. I love your sense of humor and contributions to the show. Together, you make a great team. I really hope I get to hook up with you all at self. Anyway, each week during your podcast, I feel like I'm joining a team meeting at work while learning about the latest and greatest new hardware and software in the Linux space. You truly make my week and have helped me ease into retirement. Keep up the work and thank you. All the best, Michael Tano. Or I'm sorry, uh, Brandon. <laughs> I don't it literally believe, says that. Oops, I, sorry, Brandon. I don't I don't believe that Brandon wrote that. I believe that Michael is pretending to be yeah. a man named Brandon. Because obviously he would have you know, put no or me in place of exactly expertise. Right. There so Brandon, if Michael. you exist, you should buy Ryan and I lunch when you get to self and then we'll know that you're real. Yeah, exactly. That would be, that would be something. The only way we'll know for sure. <laughs> I like how he says in here, there's a doppelganger of me and he watched one of the podcasts and said, I'm smarter than that guy. No, no, you're not. Keep trying, <laughs> buddy. But thank you, Brandon, for your message. Very awesome um, that you get to retire and, you get to retire and still utilize and love Linux at the same time. So very cool stuff. And Zeb, we want to hear from our listeners, don't we? We certainly do. Cause it's, it's emails like this that, that, that make the show. Cause we're never going to know what we're going to receive. And it, it's quite difficult for us. Cause we, we seem to be getting more and more of these, which is great. So keep sending them in. Cause we want to know what your burning question is, what your feedback is, how you got into Linux, how you use Linux, why you think Linux is the best OS out there. So send your comments in to comments at destinationlinux.org. So real quick, we want to play a fun game again because Noah, you were out. And so we had the opportunity to ask our fans, (laughs) where was Noah this week? And we got a lot of responses this week. Uh, The first one says, Noah changed his name to Neo and is fighting against the machines in the matrix. Destination Linux reloaded. Love it. Noah has joined Noah in the Whale as a lead guitar singer replacing Charlie Fink. He will perform live on Destination Linux. That I would love to see. I bet you have a beautiful singing voice. I have guitars right behind me. Nice. We'll grab one. We can do this. Noah forgot his username and password and has locked himself out, uh, which actually has happened before. So not the username and password, but he's locked yeah, himself, locked himself out, out of the studio. building before. Dang it, Bitwarden. <laughs> and then a Zamboni tractor pull finalist. That one, that sounds awesome. I mean, actually. based on the fact that he did some like the shooting and the curling thing, it, it could happen. Right. Exactly. You'll have to, what, what is a Zamboni tractor? Oh, that's that big thing that on, if you ever went to a watch of ice hockey, it's the, it's the like, big thing. Smooths that the, the ice. ice. Ah, yeah. right. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. It's like a major event in ice hockey games. At hmm. least that was the it, most exciting part for me. <laughs> because <laughs> i always thought that was just a thing that scraped the blood off the ice because the guys just kept having punch-ups up against the fence and that wow yeah Hockey's wow Sometimes probably it does. <laughs> all right so this week we're going to try something different one of the things is we've changed up hosts on this show uh throughout the years and i thought it would be great to do a little bit of a mini interview on each of the hosts, just one a week to kind of learn a little bit more about each of the hosts on the show. Because not everybody is as familiar as we would like based on some of the emails we get, for instance, talking about Alabama fans, knowing that I don't like football or sports at all. So these are the things you could learn about us as we go through some of these mini interviews. And first up is Michael, because everybody loves Michael. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, Michael, I'm going to ask a question then. I'm going to ask the first question here, and uh, we want to know how you got started in Linux. So how did you get started initially? Uh, well, the first, it's its actually a long time ago, uh, there was this, network, this TV network called uh, ZDTV, and it became Tech TV later. But hmm. ZDTV had a show called The Screensavers, and it had uh, it was hosted by Leo Laporte, and they had an interview with Linus Torvalds in like 1998. 
talking about like what Linux was and introducing it to people. And yeah. when I was a kid, I was a teenager um, about th at that time. And it was interesting to me because I wanted to try out something because I had never heard of it. And I was like, I just want to try it out. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the money to go to the store to buy the different distros that were available or internet connection because it was in the 90s that it was fast enough to download these ISOs. So uh, I waited a year and was finally able to download it when one of my friends got cable internet. So I uh, was totally not just siphoning their internet and downloading ISOs all the time. Uh, but I tried uh, a, a, a few distributions at the time, and uh, is it's an interesting thing because the process of using Linux now compared to then is so night and day that it is just uh, it's just interesting and fun, kind of amusing to me to think back about what I had to do to, in order to get all that to work. Interesting. What uh, what were some of the first distros or desktop environments that you fell in love with, Michael? Uh, well, the, the funny thing is is that. When I first started using Linux, these distros and DEs weren't any that that special, and in fact, um, the DEs that I didn't really really like a DE until like ten years later. And um, but it, the first distros I started using were uh, Debian, uh, Red Hat, and Mandrake, and uh, I basically just kind of kind of navigated towards Debian for the like the, the majority of the time but for the like the first few years um, it wasn't really that convenient to use Linux in various different reasons and you know so like when I started so early it was um, it was a, like mostly command line stuff mostly uh, get, like getting interfaces that were just brand new like for example um, XFCE was around for a couple years but it really didn't have like what it was now until like 99. So when I started using Linux, XFCE, uh, GNOME, and KDE 1 were both around released around the same time in like early 20, uh, 1999. And I started using Linux in like late 1999. So it was a very new experience to try to you know, everything I was trying was brand new. So, but I, I I gravitated towards KDE in the beginning because it was the one that was around the longest, which was only like six months more than the other ones. Uh, but it so was even back then. KDE. No, no, because oh. it was. Uh, I I was I'm a, I'm a fan of KDE now, but back then I used it because it was just around the longest, and all three of them were uh, not the best experiences at all. Uh, they <laughs> were uh, weird in various different ways. And it wasn't until probably 2010 when I actually was like, this looks good. I like this now. Um, well, well, that was for GNOME, by the way. So GNOME 2 was that kind of experience. But up to that, it was just everything looked terrible. And uh, <laughs> The dark just, ages of Linux. Yeah, you just had to get used to stuff, but that's about it. Yeah. So the next question is a, is, is a bit anomalous to me because it says here, what was it about Linux that made you stick with it? But hang on, you haven't stuck with it because you do work. That's not oh, true. Let's nice. let's, let's end that rumor I love here. It. Let's end the rumor here. There's a, they like to say that I dual boot because I have a virtual machine that has Windows in it. That is not dual booting. We've we had a conversation in multiple episodes ago, and everybody commented with like, "No, it's not dual booting." Everybody so let's, being Michael and every, one user. That's right, and th <laughs> that guy also dual boots. No. Anyway, um, so. When I first started using Linux, I didn't really stick with it that much. I mean, I kind of did, but uh, it was more of a I stuck with it in the sense of like coming back to it often. Because when the first couple years of Linux, when I started using it, it was uh, not really ready. And to be fair, in the '90s, uh, not it, Windows was barely ready to be used. So when I got I started using it more often, I essentially did it where I um, I dual booted eventually but i was like every once in a while i have like a spare computer that i would try things out on try new versions of linux try different distros and etc and they all had some kind of issues that were required like forced me to go back to windows for a while but it was um it's interesting thing is that it was until 2005 when i started using linux more prominently and then i started doing dual booting and that was because of ubuntu coming out you and just admitted to it what dual booting yeah, 15 years ago. Continue. <laughs> sure. Um, so when I did, when I when I was dual booting at the time, 
when it was because um, Ubuntu had come out. And for what was kind of interesting is I used Debian for a while, and it was uh, every every distro, even Mandrake at the time, was kind of painful to use. But Mandrake's probably the most useful at the time, uh, or user friendly at the time. But it still was, you know. But when Ubuntu start announced in 2004, I was like, yeah, sure, you're gonna make it easy to use. And they had the little tagline of Linux for human beings. It's like, okay, sure. And then I ignored it for about a year. And I came back and tried it out. And it was so much different, like so much easier right. to use Linux with Ubuntu. Uh, it still was a, a couple of years before they kind of like got their, like the, the full polished out, but it was still much easier to use. And it was, it was so, it was so good that I started doing the, the dual booting. And it was like a couple of years after that, I did the, uh, transitioning to a primary and then exclusive. Um, but that, as far as like what made me stick with it, I have no idea. I, in the beginning, you could just say it was like super painful. So masochism, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I've heard that often back then yeah. uh, from using Linux. But it was also, so, I guess, the philosophy of wanting to have an open system and not wanting to worry about viruses and all that stuff too, kind of a part of it. But I mean, really, I'd, it's been so long. I don't really have a reason why I said, I'll just keep using this. All right. So what are some of the favorite tools you use in Linux most often? I get, this is one of the top questions I get asked. What tools do you use? Now, everybody has a different workflow and we'll get into some of your work here a little bit later, but most people know you do web design and, and web development. Mm -hmm. So it, what, but what are some of your favorite tools that you use most often in Linux? Well, I mean, there's, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, I think the most fundamental piece uh, is my plasma workflow. Uh, because I can customize it to however, however I want it to be. Uh, but there's also like different tools that I use, like Sublime Text is my editor. Um, OBS I use almost every day for some kind mm -hmm. of reason, for like do podcasting or doing some videos. Um, uh, Simple Screen Recorder is also really nice um, as far as like a, a way to doing OBS without having to do all the extra effort of getting OBS to work uh, or not to get it work the way you want. Um, there's um, a variety of different applications like, you know, the cross-platform stuff like Firefox and Thunderbird and all that stuff. Um, but as far as like specific Linux exclusive stuff, I don't really know. I mean, I guess Caden Live is one. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, it, it's hard to say because there's so many things of software that I used over the years that I use all the time that what is there, is there anything that's specific that I couldn't live without? And I guess that's basically all of it really. Um, but, uh, there's, there's some tools like WM control, which is really useful that I use for doing the podcast for this one, where I can, uh, run a script and automatically move uh, the window a certain size in a certain location. So I can have it like lined up where I want it to be perfectly. Um, there's tools like, uh, MKV merge where you can do automatic scripting for editing, uh, they, uh, the, uh, well, editing video, essentially. Yes. Um, I, I use that all the time. Um, Flameshot is something I've been using quite a lot now because uh, especially like when I wanted to d demonstrate something I'm doing but it has like sensitive information, there's a cool feature that by default is not active for some reason. But if you go into the settings for Flameshot, we talked about that a couple episodes ago, but if you go in the settings for Flameshot, there's an, a blur tool that you can automatically like just activate that and just like select a section and it will just blur that part of the image out. And it's, it's really nice. It takes that, like it used to be going into like GIMP or Photoshop or something else and doing blur effects and it'd take forever. Now it's just like drag and drop done. It's awesome. And to explain that, that becomes super important when you're doing videos like, you know, maybe you're showing how to set up a digital ocean droplet. You don't yeah. want to show your IP addresses or some of the information that may be displayed right. there on a dashboard. Then, you know, when I was earlier doing videos, I'd take that, go into GIM, take some blurs, put them over. But having that feature built into your screenshot tool means less post-processing. Oh, yeah, and it takes like seconds yeah. to do it versus like, you know, 10 minutes or so to get that thing done. Whereas with Flameshot, when I was, like, when I was doing it recently, I was uh, testing out making custom dark themes for Thunderbird, which if you've ever used Thunderbird, it is kind of painful to set up the the... Well, okay, by default, Thunderbird looks ugly. And, you, and if you wanted to fix it up, you can do so with a variety of different methods. And I was just showing different themes that I was setting up for uh, for Thunderbird and letting people see, like, here's here you could have, here's what we will look like when I finish this video. 
and uh, I wanted to show it, you know, preview kind of thing, but I didn't want to show all my emails and everybody who sent me emails and what the email said and all that other stuff because, you know, that's, you know, information they probably didn't want me to share. So right. I use the blur tool and it takes me like seconds to just select the different sections of the thing and then share it out. And it used to be a part where I would not share things like that because of how much time it would take to do it out, outside of it. So it's a really cool feature. And uh, also, uh, interesting enough, there's a text feature, a, a flame shot that's also not on by default. And those are the only two things that are not on by default. So uh, they totally should be, and they're very useful when you do it. But that's just another tip for uh, that particular thing. But I use so many tools that it's hard to... You know, I, I should like make a list and just like, here's how, here's the tools I use and here's how, how often I use them. And, uh, it would be like Oprah's favorite things, but Mike, my- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Michael's favorite tools. Yeah. Nice. What are some of the things that you would like to see improve on Linux? Um, really the, the polish, the ex- user experience of getting it as well as the marketing of sharing Linux to people. Um, like companies should be putting more time into marketing, um, their, their project, almost no projects or no companies that are Linux related do any sort of marketing effort at all. Um, Ubuntu kind of does, but not really. Um, so open SUSE or SUSE does with their like parody videos, but that's pretty much all they do. Uh, there's, there's a lot of effort in certain cases and then there's no effort at all. And it's interesting because the marketing is as 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 a marketer, it's, it's kind of like the, one of the most important things you could do, and it is get people to know about your product or know about yourself. It can be simple things too, because you we've talked about this point before, where marketing is almost a second thought in a lot of Linux projects, which mm-hmm. is a, a big fail. So a lot of times when we're getting looking for a guest on the show, there'll be something exciting comes out in the news. We'll reach out to the developers, and they'll say, "Yeah, we'd love to be on the show." And it's a way to expose it to tens of thousands of people around the world to expose their um, tools or whatever software they're working on. What I find interesting in doing this show, even as much as it's grown, is there's not a ton. There's the ones you would expect, the ones who do do marketing, but there's not a ton of the smaller distro developers reaching out to us saying, hey, can we get on your show? I want to talk about this or you know, I want to talk about my distro or something different that we're doing. And that's surprising to me because we would love to have, you know, yeah. anybody who really has a, you know, something unique and you want to come on the show, we would love to talk to them. But it just kind of goes to show that they don't really, they're, they're so code minded that they really don't think, and they're brilliant, but they really don't think about that marketing aspect right. of getting their project out there. And what that results in is you see a lot of good projects eventually just die. Yeah, of totally. Non-use. And also it's, it's, they, 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 they look at it in the sense of I'm not getting enough users to justify continuing doing it, and then they would just stop doing it. When if they they might not be putting any effort to letting people know about it, and that kind of thing is a, is a, is an issue that a lot of projects are, especially open source projects, are dealing with. Um, but there's a, there's a, so many different things that I would wish they want to change. Marketing is one, um, but the, I think the most important thing, I guess maybe it's tied with marketing, but the the other one is uh, the effort to make Linux easy to use. There's a lot of people who are doing that in the back end, making hardware easy to set up and like AMD's putting all their effort into making it, it's really easy to set up and use an AMD system. Uh, basically you just install Linux and you're done. Like that is awesome. Um, but there's other things that we need to do to make like the interfaces and the, the workflows for various different systems uh, much easier for the average user. And I know a lot of people in the uh, the ecosystem or community don't really agree with that because they want it to be a unique experience for Linux. And while I think that that's great, I think that we should also focus on the user experience for the average person who's coming to try Linux for the first time because unfortunately, they're going to have expectations and we should at least, even if we don't succeed them, we should at least meet them mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. maybe change their mind after the fact. But rather than having putting barriers in front of them, for no reason, I think that that's uh, something we should address because there's there's some distros and some DEs that will make decisions that they prefer, that they think is the best solution, but at the same time is a barrier to the user who's never tried the system before. And and, and in, in some cases, if your focus is not the, the brand new user, then you know fair enough. Uh, but if they are focused on the brand new user, they should make it as you know comfortable for them as possible. Yeah. 
Cool. So you're given a chance to get a brand new lot, laptop of your choice. Um, and your options include Dell, System76, Purism, or Lenovo. So what would you go with and why? So I actually was thinking about this for a couple of weeks or so, um, like trying to just check out, because we had that con- that, that conversation about um, that laptop. If someone asked a question in the, the, the comments at destinationlinux.org, they talked about what was like the best beginner laptop or mm-hmm. lower low cost. And I was thinking, what about like a high end cost? Like if you if you were just wanted to get the best possible Linux laptop, what could that be? And then so I started looking around, and I I kind of thought that Lino- uh, System seventy six has the best offer. So like if you look at the ThinkPads, they're really cool and they they, they work quite well, but they are you know they don't look the best. So and they and they have they decent agree. hardware. But um, they their price wise is very similar to System seventy six. Uh, Dell is really like not focused on Linux, of course. So, but so their website is the most painful thing to use if you're trying to check out for whatever you want to find, and then trying to find which one has support for Linux and which one doesn't is also complicated. Uh, so, and then when you look at the hardware specs, the Dell and the System seventy six are very similar, and System seventy six has. Um, um, a little bit more up-to-date hardware than the purism so like overall price wise they're all very similar they're all like if you go for like the high-end models they're all very close to each other but system 76 refreshes their hardware line more often so mm-hmm. i think that they're probably the best option as far as like linux focused hardware um so that's what i would do um i'm also super cheap so i probably wouldn't do it but if it was given the i was just given the the, the laptop i would pick that so when we had the uh, coffee and linux event Last uh, couple weeks ago, Bo's son came down, who also is uh, a genius in, in computers and Linux and things. And of course, he opens his laptop bag, and I'm excited because I'm a hardware guy to see what he pulls out. And it's a Galago Pro System 76. So, what do you expect nice. from it? Yeah, with hacker stickers all over the back of it, you know, the skulls, <laughs> the bones, nice. all this stuff. It was very, very cool. But yeah, System 76 is what he was running to. So, what are one or two things that you hope your time as a host on destination Linux will bring to the community? I mean, that's a, that's a deep question. So, um, yep. Yeah. And you got five minutes. Okay. I need, I need at least and the whole rest of the show. Um, <laughs> but I don't, to be honest, I don't really know. I think it's, uh, my goal is to make, a, uh, my goal for all the content I make, including this show is to help people, uh, use, learn and enjoy Linux. And I say that on Tux Digital content often, but it's mainly that's that's the real the whole goal is to not only just make it possible for people to get started with Linux easier and have a better experience with it, but also to enjoy doing it and having like entertaining uh, podcast or content as much as I can. So my goal is to uh, help make this show and uh, anything else I, I do um, not only informational, but also um, entertaining. So if uh, to provide both levels of that. So I guess that's really what I hope to bring to the community, just a place to find content that's helpful and uh, something that you want to watch uh, as far as um, like, I don't know what else. I, I don't really, I don't know, I guess um, to be a beacon for the community. Okay, a that's beacon the, of hope. A beacon of hope for the, too. exactly. Okay. <laughs> That's a little. That's a little bit of exaggeration. It's just basically I just want to help people learn and, and enjoy it. Nice. What do you do uh, professionally? And I use that term lightly. <laughs> wow, I would too. That's fair. Um, no, all kidding aside, you are. I'll I'll let you answer the question. But uh, you know, all kidding aside, you are the best at what you do, and I say that unequivocally, both hands down. I would put. I'm serious. I'd put you against anybody on the planet with, with what you do professionally. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Uh, but to, be clear, to answer the question, I um, I'm a designer and a marketer. Uh, I also do a bunch of other things, uh, developing development stuff, uh, writing for tech blogs and stuff like that. But I'd say that my focus thing is mainly designer and marketer. I do logo design and web design and graphic design and user interface design, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but also marketing is one of the things that I'm really uh, passionate about as well because um, it, it's one of the things that I wanted to do for the uh, the community of Linux is to get people to know about it more and to focus on getting more eyeballs on the the ecosystem 
as as well as my content, of course. You know. So so just to just to kind of brag on Michael for a second, you uh, your work is worth thousands and thousands of dollars, right? I, I and I've worked with you uh, on a professional level with uh, with with uh, with clients and stuff like that, um, and and so you you get paid well for what you do because you deliver a really high quality product. And every time, and I do mean every single time you've ever had the opportunity to give back to the community, I've never seen you charge them for anything. And so, uh, you know, you did all of the graphic assets for, for my show. And, uh, and obviously you do it for Destination Linux and, and a, like it, basically any open source project that ever asks you that says, hey, we need some help. You give away, you know, what, tens of thousands of dollars at this point for free. I mean, yeah, and that's just I the kind so. of guy you are. So, I mean, that's if, if, if all kidding aside, a huge thank you to to all of us who wouldn't have half the quality of the the graphic arts that we have if it wasn't for Michael Tanell. You're yep. absolutely welcome, and and I never thought about it, but yeah, I mean, I do provide a lot of uh, design software and uh, graphics support for different distros and projects and stuff, and it's just because I want to, and I'll do like testing and uh, various different uh, software uh, QA stuff just because I want to do it and, you know. Besides your professional stuff, and let's let's try and move this away from Linux, if there is such a thing, what else do you get up to? What other projects are you part of? Well, I mean, away from Linux. I mean, that, that the weird thing is that I'm, a lot of my stuff is Linux-based because like, I'm, I'm, so, I'm super passionate about Linux and the ecosystem and the, and the community and open source, so a lot of my stuff is... Linux related, um, mm-hmm. and like ninety percent of it really. Um, right. So because I do like the like Tux Digital, and I do the podcast for This Week in Linux, and I do this podcast, and I do all this other stuff. But but I, I think as far as projects go, it's all Linux all the time because Linux is everywhere. It basically is all yeah. Linux all the time. Like, uh, I, I can't even think of it. Question sometimes related to we'll see a question there like, hey, is Michael part of any other podcasts? So this, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do some of these mini interviews so that people kind of understood. And we'll get it even for Noah. And I'm like, how could you not know Noah has his own podcast? Uh, but this is why I want to do some of these mini interviews, because I think it's important, you know, people become fans of Destination Linux, mm-hmm. but they don't necessarily know about each individual person and some of the projects that they're on, because there are a lot of exciting projects that each of us are a part of. So you have This Week in Linux, to be clear, which is a podcast people can download. Yep. It's a have, news podcast, yeah. actually, and it's interesting because the previous time where I explained it on this show, I explained it wrong. So I wanted to just explain it properly. <laughs> okay, it, it's a news was that, podcast. Was that on? Was that on this show that you explained it wrong? Was it, was it on my show? Uh, technically, I explained it wrong on this show, and then you used what oh, I said I the next week and explained it wrong on your show. So <laughs> right, uh, right, exactly. Okay. So it was it was well, my fault, but <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, anyway. So the the show is a. A podcast, a news podcast for Linux, what's happened related in the in Linux world, and it is talking about not just what's happening, but also I cover a wide variety of type topics where it's like distro news, uh, app news, but I also try to find uh, obscure things that are Linux related that are happening recently that you might not be aware of. So I scour through like hundreds and hundreds of different topics for news related and narrow it down to anywhere between like 15 to 20 or so and i cover the wh- what's happened wh- uh, why it's happened why you should why it's interesting why you should care and uh, why i put it on the show so it's like a and it's not just like a news headline thing it's like the headlines and then a lot of in-depth research on those particular headlines nice so one of the cool things about your show too is you do the YouTube live. So if you want to watch it be recorded, you yeah. could just join in and generally you record on Saturdays, but you probably want to join Michael's telegram group because it can change sometimes. Yeah. You could, um, you could shocking, uh, I know, but it like, can like this, this week, exactly this week, I didn't do it on Saturday. And <laughs> yeah, so. but you can join in and watch it be recorded live and also interact with him in between, which is a really cool option. Not, um, Everybody can financially, you know, pay to watch live shows and things like that. And you offer it completely free and for your channel that people can go out there and watch it get recorded. Yep. So if you're interested in how that works, you get to kind of see that live, which is pretty cool. You can see all the mistakes I do, which are many. <laughs> so besides that, what are some contributions you've made to the Linux community outside of the podcast podcast that you do? Well, I've done... Um, like the variety of different types of, of contributions, whether it's documentation, whether it's code or graphics or uh, bug reports or just testing. 
um, I've contributed to a variety of different projects, not only just uh, uh, distros like uh, Ubuntu Mate, Intergos, uh, Linux Mint, um, Lubuntu, Kubuntu, KDE Neon, uh, let's see, some other, uh, Arch Linux specific, like not just Intergos, but also Arch itself. You. Um, uh, Magia, Debian, pro- uh, Slackware a little bit, and some other things that, you know, every, here and there. Uh, as far as distros go, but also some applications I've kind of helped with, with OBS, um, Conversation, Caden Live, um, anything that I use, I try to do as much as contributions that I can to help benefit not only it's like bug reports, but also if I see a problem that I could help fix or, you know, suggest a better way of doing something, I'll submit it to it. Uh, like recently, I submitted some better, uh, my opinion, some suggestions to Kubuntu to have better shortcut layouts by default. Uh, that could be improved, like because there's a lot of cool features that Plasma has that no distro actually has by default and access to use them. So you might not even know that they exist. So I provided some suggestions of how to set up those as a default to have them in like the, a future release to have those available by default, so people could like you know discover them and experience them. Um, you know, there's a variety of different things. Uh, uh, also, some applications like UGit, where I'm the project manager for it, and I've been working on that one for like over a year, over a decade. I mean, and um, so that one is like probably the I think it was the first project that I joined, and the only, it's the one I've been around in the longest. It's a download manager application. So, like, there's a lot of those now, but uh, there's like the only one really at the time when I started using Linux. So I jumped in and started working on it. Um, so that's uh, variety of different things. Um, I think it, if I, I really can't count them all or tell you all of them because there's so many of them that I don't remember them all. Um, and also there's applications that if I just see something that I'm using and it's like, Hey, I could fix this or here's a problem. I'll contact the developer or su- submit some patches and a variety of things. And like now I'm doing a bunch of touch testing. So every single time I see something that I could potentially see a problem with or have a solution for, I'll contact the developers of Ubuntu of a UB ports and Ubuntu Touch and offer suggestions or offer fixes and all kinds of stuff. So so I think the key is, and you're going to see this as we do these interviews around, is get involved in Linux. So it's not, mm-hmm. to, to me, that's one of the most important messages to get out there. Linux, ta- or, um, Linux. Uh, Noah talks about this on his show, uh, as well as ways of networking, even improving potentially your career opportunities out there by oh, yeah. getting involved. But get involved in Linux. Don't just use it. Don't just be an enthusiast, but find ways to get involved. And it doesn't have to be financial. And not all of these that you talked about were tremendously time consuming where you're sitting there learning to write code. You were talking about things where I help out by just, hey, I see this issue. I send it to developers. They can do with it what they want. They may like it. They may not. But at least you took the time, five minutes, 10 minutes to say, here's what I'm seeing. Here's the steps I take to recreate it. Here's some screenshots of the issue and send it on. Yeah, sometimes I'll see a bug, and then um, it's hard to explain the bug in like a, a profile, like a like a bug report. So I'll just make a video of that bug and then send them the video. And there, and a couple times where they're like, when you described it in the description, I had no idea what you're talking about. Then I saw the video and I was like, oh, I totally could, I could fix that, and they yeah. fixed it in the next release. So that kind of thing is is a little also helpful. Uh, documentation is is incredibly helpful, and I've helped with there. Um, you know, there's if the the interesting thing about it is that. A lot of people are kind of worried about not contributing in some way where they're like they think that they don't they don't know enough to contribute. And even the smallest contribution is 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 uh, welcomed by almost every project. If you have just like I had this one problem, here's what I did to address it or, you know, this is a workaround, but maybe you could fix it in fully in the code or something. Uh, That kind of feedback is incredibly helpful. And also a lot of projects don't even know that people know a certain amount of people are using their thing. Like we have, um, like you get, we have download stats to how many people were using it. But if that's only for a certain set of where they download from, if they install from the repo, we have no idea that they used it. So, you know, just contacting the thing and letting them know, like just even thank you for making this software is something that can help a project continue on because they get the motivation from it. So there's so many different ways to contribute that uh, if you worried about you know you not you not be you're not a developer or a designer or whatever there's tons of ways you can do so with outside of those. Lastly, Michael, can you tell us something other than the fact that you are a filthy dual booter that people <laughs> wouldn't ordinarily know about you? Love it. 
So I'm not a dual booter. That's that's key. That's one thing that people. Is that, appar- is that the thing? That appar- people apparently, people on this show don't know that. So, uh, <laughs> but I um, I don't know. There's a lot. There's a, I don't. There's a lot of stuff. I, I just I'm open if they How ask me a question. What do you? What do, let me ask you something. What do you do? What do you do as a hobby? Like when you're not when you're not sitting in front of your computer. What are, what's something that you I don't do understand like? the question. <laughs> <laughs> not sitting in front of the computer. What? When does? What do you? Huh? I don't understand the question. Yeah, Michael. Um, thank you so much for being the first up for this. And uh, it's not always easy being <laughs> interviewed by your friends, but right. it being is, the guinea pig for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is important for everybody to get to know about the hosts of the show a little more. And we'll do one of these segments each week. And next week, we'll probably have Zeb or Noah up to answer uh, some of these questions here. So with that, um, let's get on to the news. So not a week goes by where we don't seem to learn something new from the GNOME team. Um, And this week, it's GNOME 3.32 has been released. Now, this was of particular interest to to me because at the moment I'm using uh, Fedora 29 on GNOME. So I thought, oh, 3.32, rolling release. We'll soon get it. Let's see what's coming along. So this release has been focused heavily on performance improvements for the GNOME shell. Uh, Mutter and related architecture. Now, we always hear about how heavy the GNOME shell is and we've had the memory leaks. So this is all all good news to people who love GNOME. So in addition to the performance improvements, you'll get some new features like fraction scaling in the GNOME shell. And it was like, yes, at last. And then they say, unfortunately, this (laughs) is not enabled by default outside of Wayland. So you'll need to manually enable it. Um, there's new app control uh, via the settings. Applications pane lists installed applications and provides an overview of repo app key settings and permissions. You can control these via toggle switches along with flat pack apps. That's cool. So this I is, like that. Yeah, this is, this is like a twist on your normal settings control where you can dig even deeper into each of, of the individual application settings. So it's going to be like another one-stop shop where you can just go and get everything set up the way you want it. There's a new GNOME icon set and an improved ad waiter theme to make the, the interface look even more modern and welcoming. Now, this is the one section that's coming up next that made me not try and update it on Fedora. Application menus were marked for removal this go around, so app developers were busy moving items listed in the app menu to an in-app menu. I'll ask what the difference is between the two in a moment. So some apps moved to header bars like Rhythmbox and Gnome Terminal. So expect some of your apps to look differently. And then they've worked on making the software sensor faster for searching and faster Google Drive mounting. So it looks like some massive work all around to bring an improved look and feel and control to the GNOME desktop. And it's available now. So check it out. So I'll go back to my first statement of I'm running Fedora 29 GNOME. So I thought, right, how do I do it? So Googled it. It's not coming to Fedora until version 31, I believe. No, 30 is so going to have it. Would, oh, it's gonna, 30 is going to have yeah, it. Yeah, 30 is going to have it. So how would I put it on my current system without balking it because of all these things that's happened with the application menus and stuff? Well, I mean, the... The updating system of installing a DE is the same thing of any distro that's a stable base. Because like a Fedora is an interesting thing because it's not stable, but it's also not rolling uh, because they do like a once a year full uh, release, and they do like six month stuff too. But mainly it's like once a year. Um, but the, the the process of upgrading from one to the other is really simple and smooth. It's just like hey, here, well, it's in the past like five or so releases. You could just do a click an update button and it just updates and you get the new version of GNOME and everything. So hmm. like those kind of distros will have that kind of situ- setup. Whereas like Ubuntu 1904 will probably have thir- 332, but mm-hmm. you're not going to get 332 on 1804. Like it's not going to no. be backported. So, and it depends like the, like the newest version of whatever distro is going to have the newer release or unless you have like a rolling release thing, you got to update there. Uh, but as far as like the app menu and the, in, the in-app menu, to be fair, the app menu no one used it like almost no one used it as users and definitely like very few developers used it which also kind of created why the users didn't use it but a lot of people didn't even know it was there or what it was for because that when you wow. when you set up a uh previously still right now if you were to use an application 
uh, that'll have on the, t the top panel, they'll have the name of the application and a little arrow drop down. That is the menu, the app menu for that application. So it was kind of mm -hmm. like a global menu, except it was um, in one location and it didn't really tell you it was a menu. So a lot of people didn't know it was there or what it was for. Right. Um, and developers occasionally would use it, but very few would. So they would have like, instead of having applications or buttons that are in the window, they would just put it up there for like easy mm -hmm. access. So yeah. it, it's most people will not see any re negative response to that at all because they mm -hmm. probably didn't use it anyway. Yeah. So going back to my, my, my question there, will I balk my system if I tried to update it to 332 on Fedora 29? If you are trying to just install the packages from source or whatever, um, maybe. But if the mm -hmm. packages are provided by Fedora themselves and they provide you the ability to do a, like a rawhide update, more than likely it'd be fine. It depends. But mm -hmm. as far as like uh, the applications are not going to be, they're just going to be different appearance mm -hmm. and stuff. Like yeah. they won't, they're not going to break anything just because they changed this one piece because a lot yeah, of applications right. are not using this anyway. So there's not much of mm -hmm. a problem here. But it's not something that your average Joe should try and go ahead and do. Wait for the distribution to push I, it out. Well, if you're I on don't something think like no. Arch, you could do it and push it and be fine. Well, if you're on something like Arch, you wouldn't have to, right? Yeah, it would automatically just update when right. you do the update. So gotcha. in the cases of like, depending on what your distro is, I think that most people should not be managing the DEs like at all. They should just let their distro manage it. And mm -hmm. because it's how complicated the infrastructure of having how they all interconnect and everything it's just not a good idea. And also, mm -hmm. this is a completely side tip, but uh, if you are using a DE on a particular distro, don't install another DE on top of it because you're just going to create this huge mess of weird packages because they're going to have conflicts mm -hmm. and stuff. Just have one DE, let the distro update it, and depending on which distro you have, you can either just keep using the same one to get updates or just upgrade your whole system to the next release, and you'll, you'll get the new DE versions and everything. Nice. Thank you. So up next, there's also another uh, big release for Sway, which is the a window manager for Wayland, and they've released 1.0, which is a big milestone for their the window manager because there's a ton of work that's been put into it. Uh, yeah. This this first this release is not a first release, but this big release of 1.0 uh, brings a lot of stability and bug fixes from the previous versions. But the the thing is that it's, it's actually um, a work of over 300 people that have been doing over 9,000 commits and have got to the point where it's almost 100,000 lines of code. So this is a very impressive uh, amount of work that they're doing to make uh, this particular window manager work on Wayland. So if you're not familiar, Sway is a window manager for Wayland that is like using the same kind of flow and ideas of the i3 window manager. And yeah. I, the i3 developers decided that they didn't want to port it to Wayland. So um, Sway took that as an opportunity to create a method to make bring that to Wayland. So also really cool is that the, um, the Sway team has uh, done a lot of work with collaboration between other window managers to get them to work on the on their on the Wayland uh, ports as well. And a lot of these things like uh, WXL Roots is a lot of work that's been done to as a collaboration to get uh, having one library that all these window managers could utilize in order to have instead of having to build their own approach. So that's very, very cool. Yeah, I absolutely love the work that they're doing here. In fact, when I saw some of the amount of people that are working on this project and the amount of commits, I kind of sat there and thought, I wonder if i3 even has that many people working on it. Um, you know, this is a this is a huge undertaking and it shows the importance of these window manager tools, how important they are to people. But it's also eventually, and I know this is a big meme at this point, but eventually we're going to move to Wayland. It's going to happen. Um, I think it will happen. And this type of having these type of options available, like an i3 alternative out there that, you know, they seem to collaborate well with the i3 team because I'm pretty sure on some of the articles or on the website with i3, they'll recommend Sway in there. So there's got to be some cross collaboration in there uh, between the two. But they're also doing just a lot of cool work here with some of the features and tools that they're releasing, like the Waybar, the virtual board, the clipboard, you know, all of these things that you take for granted. And it's almost like the conversation, Michael, we had for the cell phone and Ubuntu ports touch where there's so many things that have 
we take for granted now on our phone, but 10 years ago didn't exist on a phone. Like oh, yeah. simple things like cut and paste, for instance, you know, yeah. that wasn't always there uh, for people to utilize depending on the platform that you use. So there, there are these things you take for granted on a desktop environment that they are busy making sure exist um, that aren't, you know, huge to say, ooh, a fancy wallpaper manager. But if you don't have a way to manage wallpapers, you'll miss it. So That's there true. are mm-hmm. things like that, that that do matter out there that they're doing a ton of work on. And 1.0 is a huge release for them when you think about the amount of commits and code. But they also said in here, which I thought was interesting, the devs themselves, what they had to say about the release is 1.0 improves performance in every aspect. It offers a more faithful implementation of Wayland and exists as a positive political force in the Wayland ecosystem, pushing for standardization, cooperation among Wayland projects. So what they're looking at is that them committing their work here is helping to push Wayland forward to being adopted, which is what, you know, the meme is out there. It's been 10 years. You'll see people even write comments. It's been out for 10 years. It's still not been adopted. It's never going to happen. Well, groups are out there doing things like this to try to push it and make it a thing. And as an AMD user, pretty easy for me to use Wayland. So I need to check out some Sway. Yeah. Now that I'm also an AMD user, I should also try out some, some Sway or some of those Wayland based. So no, your choice, your turn. Uh, I am also an AMD user. And so Sway is something I'm going to check out. Oh, Zeb, <laughs> sorry. We'll have to leave you out of this one. Well, that's okay. Because then I'm, a, I'm an Dirty NVIDIA user. user. <laughs> I'm an NVIDIA user. And being as, as, being as Wayland's never going to come out, it doesn't matter. So he'll just he'll just stay stuck on Xorg. <laughs> well, works we'll, for me. We'll leave you in the dust with our Wayland migration here soon. No, uh, Zeb. A new release for the Linux battery optimization tool called TLP 1.2 is out. TLP has been released after a year's worth of development. Now, TLP, if you're not familiar with it, is a program that provides battery optimization to get the most battery life you can out of your Linux machine. Now, the great thing about TLP is you can simply install it and forget about it, or you can dig in and configure it to your liking. Now, the tool detects when your laptop is running on AC or battery. It applies various settings like scaling your processor frequency, setting the disk APM spin down, timeout, setting Wi-Fi to power saving mode, enabling or disabling integrated radio devices, and more. TLP 1.2 features the following enhancements. Support for NVMe drives. Manual mode to keep TLP AC battery settings until reboot or until the user runs TLP start. Intel GPU frequency limits. You can now set the Intel GPU minimum and maximum boost frequency depending on your laptop running on AC or battery. A TLP R DW, that's a new command to disable RDW actions temporarily until reboot. USB blacklist for the wireless WAN card, disabled by default. USB exclude scanners, managed by Libsyn and auto suspend. And keep ASPM default to allow the laptop to enter a deeper sleep state when on AC with the default TLP configuration. Now, let me ask you guys something. I uh, Most of this makes perfect sense to me, but I am not familiar with... Um, RDW. What is RDW? Pop. Okay, at least I wasn't the only one. No, so, you're not the only one. There. Okay, so it does RDW. If anybody knows, then uh, then go ahead and write in. The, 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 the bottom line is, one of the things that we see when we watch Linux laptops compare, being compared to Windows uh, computers or Mac, and not so much, I guess, on the Windows side, but certainly on the Mac side, is people say, a battery life, battery life, battery life, battery life. Oh, the MacBook is so great because it's a gigantic battery that a computer just hangs off the end, and so you get 95 hours, and even when the computer dies, you can still it's still useful because it's still a pretty thing that you can, you know, that's the kind of ridiculous things that the, the, the Mac users get off on. And um, as a Linux user, what I found is on my ThinkPad, for example, this, this uh, X270, I, don't, I never charge the thing. I mean, I plug it in in the morning, I let it, or at night, I let it charge up and then I use the thing without having it plugged in all day because it's so fantastic. Uh, and so applications like TLP allow me to milk every last bit of power out of the battery. And so I've got actually two batteries in this unit and it goes a lot further. Um, and so it's interesting that there are people that are working on these projects and making sure to 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 kind of tweak all of this stuff and so we can get better and better battery life performance. Yeah, there's actually I have a laptop that has uh, terrible battery performance. So using TLP makes it a lot easier and I can exp- I can do it at least like 30, 40 percent better uh, battery life just That's by doing my these experience things. too. 
Yeah. And it's really cool. I mean, I love the fact that you can go in and configure it to, mm -hmm. um, like specific things, or you could just let it do its like defaults. Cause the defaults are really nice too. Cause if you like me and you're just lazy and you just set the defaults, it's fine. But, uh, I, I, I like how you could just say, you know, you could just set it and forget it. Yep. Mm -hmm. So a quick question I just thought of as well. I mean, I tend to run all my laptops at optimum power cause I'm never that far away from, um, a power supply, but, Am I right in still thinking that the batteries within laptops nowadays are still limited to the number of power cycles they can go through? So if you're having to repower it every four hours against repowering it every eight hours, the person who does it every eight hours, their battery is going to last longer, or is that not it's necessarily a, true? It's, it's a functional it's a functional lithium ion technology, right? And so lithium ion technology has a maximum amount of charge cycles, mm -hmm. and uh, so every time you run one of those charge cycles, you are diminishing, you are subtracting one from the life of the battery. So the 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 way to get the most amount of uh, life out of your battery is is two things. Limit the amount of charge cycles, and mostly what you want to do is limit the amount of heat dissipation that occurs inside of the battery. So if you run the battery to 85% and then charge it back up and then run it down to 85% and charge it back up, and you just kind of use that that little last portion of the battery, the amount of heat that is going into the battery, because it's, it's not running that full charge cycle, you'll maximize the life out of the battery. Now, that's interesting because it's it, that's contrast to the nickel cadmium batteries that we used to have. Mm -hmm. where uh, where you would want to you would actually develop a rut in the battery and if you only ran for the last 15 percent of the battery uh, eventually your battery would only discharge to 85 percent and then it would die mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. so you wanted to have a full cycle and so what i do on my laptops and i've had this laptop for probably almost three years and i still get 13 14 hours out of it um wow. I'll, I'll discharge to 85 or i try not to go below like 70 percent and then once a week i'll run it all the way down and run it all the way back up and uh i magic uh pray to the gods whatever it that seems to work for me nice. yeah it's not actually good practice to keep your laptop plugged in forever and never remove it from no that'll kill it too yeah and yeah. that that's why you see a lot of work laptops in fact a lot of the refurbs that you'll find are generally replaced batteries almost always mm -hmm. and that's yeah. because they sit them at their desk and they plug them in and they never leave docs man Docs, the, 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 all of the laptops that we put, uh, we're taking off lease now, the keyboards still sometimes even have the little plastic thing over the, over the palm rest. I mean, that's how yep. new the screens, it, it, just impeccable, perfect condition, batteries are shot. Uh, and that's why, because like you say, they plug them into the dock and they leave them there for two years and it just destroys the battery. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the best, in that kind of case, the best thing to do is to take the battery out. If you're going to use a laptop for like yes. the majority of it on the power, just take it out. That way you don't worry about it. And I'm pretty sure that they, the recommendation is to like charge it to 40% or 40 to 60%, then take it out. And that way it doesn't have like the full charge. And like, I don't know why that matters, but that's what, that's what's set. You know? Manufacturers actually ship the batteries is with the 40, 60% because draining them down to zero can hurt it. And it's just, you know, keeping a certain percentage above zero. Uh, 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 on there. So you don't really want to run your laptop all the way down to zero all the time. Noah's recommendation was perfect actually for battery maintenance. You want to cycle it. That's really the key. All right. Next up in the news, we have Firefox Send. Firefox has released a new tool for free to do secure file sharing. Now you remember last week we talked about a program uh, called Onion Share, which was essentially doing a very similar thing. So this is a, another option out there that you can utilize. So Firefox Send service lets you send a one gigabyte encrypted file without even needing to sign in. So you don't have to sign up for anything. You can just go up there, send a one gigabyte file and 2.5 gigabytes if you actually have an account there. Files can be made available up to 100 downloads or seven days, whichever is first. And I believe there's some customization options in there for um, configuring what who can go in there and actually grab the file or how long it's up there. So it's yes. up to seven days, but you could set it to one, two, three, four. Yeah. You can within. choose the amount of downloads and the amount of days or time that you want to allow it. So the minimum I think is a day and the up maximum is a seven days, but you can choose whichever one you want. And I think it's like one download to a hundred downloads and you can choose whichever one you want. Uh, Very cool. There's also an ability to do a uh, password attachment. So you can make it where in order to download from that link, they have to have the password to see what's there. So there's there's nice. a there's a lot of cool features to it, and those the, all those features work with that one gigabyte. So the, if you don't want to have an account, the only limitation is the one the one gig thing. 
So this is just as easy as Onion Share. Essentially, is you go, you navigate to a Firefox web page, you drag a file into the window. It's going to generate a URL. That's and then you set your settings there, and you could send that URL off to say Michael. Hey, I've got this new wallpaper. I want you to check out. And boom, you could go out there and grab it. And additionally, they're going to make an Android app for this service in the future. So just a really cool way we wanted to mention of another option to be able to send and receive files with. Yeah, uh, I've, I've actually cool. been testing this service for a long time because it was a part of the test pilot program. And it was, they used to have it where it was limited to one download or one day. And then now this, when they, as they release it and announce the full service, it's these, all these different extra features. And I think that the, the adding the extra, like the only negative it had for me was with that one download one day thing. And now you can, cause if you say, you know, I have to upload it to multiple people, I do it at multiple times. It's not that good, but now you can control how many people get to do it. I think this is a fantastic service and I think it will be a lot of, very useful to a lot of people, especially considering I, you don't need to have a special browser to do it or anything. I would really like to see integration, not only with the browser, but also maybe with Thunderbird. So for example, one of the things I run into all the time is uh, I go to attach something and then I get a little message that says, hey, you need to use a third party service because uh, mm -hmm. this attachment is too large to be able to be sent over a, a traditional email. It would be great to have that tied into Firefox Send where it just, I browse the attachment and if it's over a certain you know, file limit or whatever, instead of uploading into the attachment, it just automatically uploads to Firefox Send and then drops a link in the email. I mean, that would be, I mean, they could do some really cool stuff that with this. Be, this yeah, I mean, awesome. this it's really amazing in 2019 that there's there hasn't been another solution to this problem, right? Like yep. right now, everybody just they sign up for a Dropbox account to use a Google Drive account, or in my case, I use C file. But uh, it's amazing to me that nobody has come up with a solution for this because this is a problem that has existed for 20 years, and mm -hmm. this is really the first simple solution I think we've ever seen, widespread anyway. Yeah, yep. it's, it's, it's simple to use, simple to, to share, and like. Uh, the fact that it doesn't require it doesn't require you to have any ex integration and ex uh, extensions or whatever to do it, but I think that's a great idea to having like a Thunderbird integration where like often people will say just send it an email. It's like well the file is too big. Twenty five megs is the maximum for email. So if you have anything better than that, do you have to deal with how do I get it to this person? So sometimes before this existed, I'd be like okay I'll just upload it to my server and then give you the link to the server and here's where it is and all this other stuff. It's like, yeah, that works, but it's so much so painful to do that. And for a lot of people don't have that kind of access to a server or something. Uh, this makes it so much easier. You just upload the file, just get them a yeah. link. You're done. I love it. Kind of going along on the same, uh, on the same idea of open source and contribution and the problems that come along with that. There was an interesting post on Reddit this week. And the title of the post was, I think I've made a mistake getting into open source. And essentially, it was a guy who created two projects that have that have become incredibly popular. And he submitted this uh, onto Reddit and it kind of blew up and he kind of looked over and there's people submitting bug reports and there's people were su submitting feature requests. and There's people all over the place bragging on this project. And he kind of step, stepped back and went, whoa, I'm a little overwhelmed here. Like, this is all great that you like my project, but I don't have the time to, to do this. Now, Ryan, I know you have had kind of maybe to a lesser extent, but you have had kind of a similar experience. Well, I, I, yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I would I never got frustrated about it, but I did have a project specifically the installer script that I set up that got pretty popular. Talking about not nothing like this individual's project where he's got four hundred stars, but it got pretty popular. A lot of people utilizing it. And one of the difficult things is when you put something out there and it's open source, people want to contribute to it. But the first way that they start contributing to it isn't necessarily giving you code and things. They're not forking it and then giving you codes. They're opening bug reports or they're saying, hey, I want this, in my case, I want this program installed. I use this program. I created the install script just as a simple way for me to remember the apps I like to use on a brand new install when I was doing a lot of distro hopping. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want to maintain it out of whatever I had utilized. But I started seeing, well, all these other people are interested in it, kind of got the hype train going. So I'll add all these apps that they want. But now I've got to support it every time a new version comes out and things like that or write code uh, to be able to handle that. So what's interesting about this is I found this as a interesting article because he took everything here on himself. And I think that's almost going against what open source is. So in my case, how I fixed it, I found somebody who was actually contributing code with me to the project. And I said, hey, I'm going to add you as a maintainer because I trust you. I've seen a lot of the code that you add in and I'm going to add you in here to help with it. So 
I kind of left it out there. Plus, you have the ability just for people to fork it and make it whatever they want. I've written the code for what I use it for. They can go mm. fork it, do whatever they want with it from there if they want to add in programs and everything else. So I guess at the end of it, this individual kind of got frustrated with something because they went to open source but didn't utilize the advantages of open source, which is you can let it go to the community if you want to. So I think it another- felt like an obligation to them. I think that's what he was. The problem was that he felt like he was obligated because he shared this, that he's being a part of the community and therefore is obligated to continue building what people want him to do, even though he doesn't really want to use those particular features or whatever. Um, and the, the important thing to note, I say, is that they you're not obligated to do anything in, in terms of open source is if you're posting something as uh, giving code away. You're not obligated to do anything except, you know, help, help, you know, just put it out there and see if anybody wants to use it or wants to fork it or whatever. And I think that's what the thing is, is like he thought that he had to, in order to be a participant in the open source community, he had to actually like fully embrace the the project maintainer aspect of it rather than just creating software and letting it go. I can see that. I, I'll tell you, the the natural business guy in me, where I come at with this, is I'd be if I woke up in his shoes, I would go, yeah, sure. You know what we're going to do? This is popular enough. Let's see if I can get some people to pay for it. Let's see if I can get some people to yeah. to donate some money to a contribution. Then I take that money and I turn around, hire some developers. I just manage the thing and, uh, and, and grow it. But you know, that admittedly, that might not be for everybody. I'm a very entrepreneurial person. I'm always creating a new way to make a buck. Right. Uh, so I look at that stuff and I'm like, ah, I'd be all over that, but that may not be for you. Maybe it's, maybe you're one of those people that you just, it's a hobby for you and you want it to stay a hobby. Uh, so I understand that, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with the sentiments, both you, Michael and Ryan. I, I think that he just approached this the wrong way. Uh, let the community step in and help you. And you know what I found? And this is really hard to, to understand when it happens to you. The community always has your best interest in heart. By and large, they always have your best interest in heart. And sometimes they will be rude and and unkind in the way that they relay that information to you, but it's because they want you to improve. So all of these people that are submitting bug reports, to I bet to a degree, it felt like they were whining and complaining about something they got for free. But the truth is that they were excited and passionate about a project that he started, and they just want to make it better. And so... Mm. To anybody out there that is struggling with feeling overwhelmed, that's what I would tell you is try to keep in mind, and not that there aren't exceptions to the rule, but the vast majority of people in the internet have your best interest at heart, just they're very direct most of the time. Oftentimes they use coarse language and they're going to tell you how it is, but it's it's with the best of intentions most of the time. Yeah, I would have to agree that there's a lot of times where I'm doing some software on GitHub or whatever, and I'll have some bug reports that someone submits and go, well this is like the scope of what they were requesting is so ridiculous that I couldn't physically do it myself. And therefore I point them to somewhere else. Like here's another project that's similar. This might be what you want, but there's other times where people will, you know, submit things that, uh, I had one time where I had a, a project where someone submitted some patches, but their patch, their patches essentially restructured the whole thing. And I was sent them back with like, well, this is interesting. And I do like your idea. This seems like to be a completely different project now. So if I were to do this, it would just lose whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Now, most time, when you get a bug report and you you don't want to accept it or pull it in, uh, and you say this is why it's not going to happen, most of the time people will um, totally understand and they'll just move on, or they'll provide us another option. Sometimes, though, uh, as Noah said, there can be some people who are um, going to react in a negative way. But that 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 situation is um, if you're not c comfortable with being, uh, you know, in the project manager lead, I can understand why people would be uh, bothered by that. And I think that some cases where you'll see um, a, like the unfortunate situation of this guy having it feeling like he has an obligation because of all these different people need, wanting to use this thing, and it, it's a, it's a, it's unfortunate because the software itself could be very useful to a lot of people. And he didn't want to actually share what the particular software he was talking about in this Reddit thread because he didn't want to get even bigger and get more people doing it. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a situation where sometimes the community is um, like kind of needs to chill out on the way it does things. And it kind of brings up to the point where 
you know, you have the situation where you're saying it's like there, there's a lot of people who are very direct and they use coarse language and stuff, which is, you know, understandable in some cases, but the community needs to be more welcoming as well. And sometimes where like once this guy made this post, everybody was responding with, you know, something very nice, but we have to be in like, we have to be engaged before we will respond in a, in a positive way. Whereas in the other, other ways it was like, we, like a lot of people in this community will see as so, so, software that is open sourced as like they're entitled to that software. Yeah. And when they, when they don't get an update for a while, they're like, well, this software is terrible because it hasn't updated in a while. But like you got to think about the incentive that the developer has in order to do it. And if you contact them and say, hey, thank you so much for making the software. I appreciate it. That's all I wanted to say. That there itself removes the obligation and brings motivation and fun to it. So there, there's many, many options. Like even if you don't have uh, code or whatever to, to put into the software, just let them know that you you appreciate their work. And that itself would, would, would might potentially make it for some developers like this not have a you know an obligation feeling to it. Yeah, I agree 100%. And just to add on to what Noah said, you know, these developers out there should consider, especially if you have a project like this, if it's if it fits with what they're wanting to accomplish. But if you're spending a lot of your free time doing this, time is money. And you should put at least a donation option out there. And that can be a huge motivator. I remember when I did the install script, the first time I received a donation, I was like, oh no, now I am obligated to actually uh, get this thing updated again. <laughs> But it, it is a motivator, but it was a good motivator, right? Because people were actually spending their hard-earned money to help make the project go forward. That was huge to me. It was the first time I'd ever put an open source project out there. And then somebody giving me money for it, I just felt like I'm not worthy for that at all. But okay. And, you know, I added to it to the point where I needed it. And then when I no longer wanted it, I helped the community kind of came in and are helped maintaining it out there now. So I just think that, you know, there's a lot of options out there and I don't want people to be discouraged in putting their code out there. Um, even if yeah. it's something where you're like, oh, I just took this from a different bunch of different places on forums and put it together in one area. Start a, start a GitHub page or whatnot, throw it out there and see what happens with it. Because sometimes it's your idea of putting things together, even though it's not your code as long as it's all open source, uh, putting things together and you should probably give credit to the different app things that you've put together. But sometimes that's the jump off of another idea for other people, et cetera. So I don't, I, I, I hated seeing this because the guy seemed overwhelmed and there were so many great solutions. Thankfully on our Linux community came in and offered a lot of the solutions and suggestions like we had here. Uh, but for anybody listening who has projects out there, there's a definitely a lot of ways that you can uh, utilize the open source community to get these things uh, fixed. Yeah. And also no, just, and want, just asking for be, people help to be the people who are going to jump in and want to help. Mm -hmm. So there's actually another thing that's uh, kind of interesting as well is that you talked about the donation stuff. That is probably something that people are worried about doing because they don't want to have like, they don't want to feel like they're like putting themselves out and saying this code is worth paying for, or they don't want to have like the obligation at that point to say, yes, I'm making it because you're paying me like there, but there is something that to say that there are some projects that do it for voluntary work, but, and don't offer a donation ability, but they're doing so much good work that you want to provide something. So it's another thing that the donation part is, some people just want to donate because they want to feel like they're contributing and the only thing that they think that they can is money. And mm -hmm. if they don't have that, they kind of feel like they're just, they're in a situation where they can't help at all. And, uh, you know, some people might not have time to do documentation or whatever, but they do have the ability to send like five bucks a month or even just five bucks one time. That is a, a, a something that people should look into doing if you're a project manager. There's actually been a times where I've contributed to somewhere and I talked to the developer about it and they was like, I was, you've been using this, you've been making this software for years. How, how many donations you got? And his, his, I think he said like $15 ever. I'm like, well, yeah. why is that? He's like, I don't know. I guess people don't think it's that good. And I said, so when was the last time you asked for a donation? Never. That is why you didn't get a donation. Just yeah. ask for the, just, and, and as soon as I told him, he, he announced, he started doing the donation thing and asking and people, he said like every once in a while, every, like at least once a month, someone will give him something that is like that in itself is worth doing. Cause even if you uh, just, if you just ask for something, ask for people to help, however they can help, most people are willing to do so. Yep. I do a thing where every, I get paid every two weeks and when I get my paycheck, I go and I try to donate something to an open source project. There are certain projects I 
I donate to on a regular basis. And there are things that I like to do like ad hoc. And there are so many instances though, where I'm using a great piece of software and there's no way I can find to give anything to them. And I appreciate that they do that, but I wonder how many of those are just thinking that nobody cares about my project or whatnot. So you can send them a nice note, like you said, but you know, if you are in one of these projects, you know, at least consider throwing a donation button up there so that people like us can at least give you something to say thanks. Exactly. So let's move on to some uh, some other news, and so we're going to talk about some gaming in this particular case. Uh, this is actually kind of some negative news here, but um, Valve has announced, or not announced, but Valve has stated that they're kind of losing some players for their latest game. So uh, Artifact is the uh, card game that they created that is um, a very interesting card game. It's very unique, but at the same time, there's some issues that it had that is making the users kind of dwindle down. Uh, so back in January, they had uh, 2,000 active players from their pre- when their launch was like, uh, I don't think they actually gave the number out, but it was a ridiculous amount of people. Uh, and now it's gone down to around 600 players. And it's, it's, it's kind of to the point where uh, even people who are working on that game are no longer being participating. Like the guy who's uh, he's also the, the, the creator of Magic the Gathering, uh, Richard Garfield. He has no he's no longer working on the project for Artifact, and so it's it's solely in Valve's hands to try to re, rejuvenate it. Um, but this he's he wasn't an employee of Valve, or he was just like a contractor type. So it's not like that much of a like it's not a employee leaving the project or anything. But it is an it, something worth noting that it could be. Uh, a sign of what's to come. Well, it's it's definitely interesting to think that a company as large as Valve can get something wrong. Um, you know, not everything that they do is going to be a guaranteed hit. People came along, they saw the game, they thought, yeah, well, I have some, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't what I expected. Oh, well, next, let's move on. So even the big yeah. boys can get it wrong. Well, this is just another... Uh, there are so many of these large gaming companies out there. Noah talked about being an entrepreneur and finding ways, you know, to turn something that's a great idea into profit and such. There does get a point where it seems these companies get so big that they don't know how to do that anymore, right? The old Valve would release a game. It would be super hit. And you know what the difference was? They were close enough to the community that they knew what the players were wanting. When you think about things like Half-Life and TF2 and CSGO, they knew what their customers want. They were players and gamers themselves. They understood it. And then what seems to happen, and I'm not saying this happened at at Valve necessarily fully yet, but what seems to happen in a lot of these game studios is they start filling it up with suits, right? The guys who are just like business, 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 but they don't play games. They just know how Mm -hmm. to try to turn a profit, how to add new ways to get people to spend money but they're not. And and this is what this product is because everything points to this should be a perfect cash cow for Valve. It was a great game, beautiful graphics, incredible soundtrack, gaming on Linux. Liam loved it. I played it, thought, you know, at at the beginning, even though I couldn't win the tutorial, a little too difficult, (laughs) Um, but I thought it was was a beautiful game overall. And I had fun and I had played games like this before. But at the end, when you look at the fact that the way that they were trying to get people to spend money, you had to spend $60 on the game. And then every time you wanted to add packs of cards and things, you had to spend more money on top of it. Whereas other games in this genre would do what they call grinding. Whereas if you play a certain amount of matches, you could win free decks throughout. So people Mm -hmm. who didn't have a lot of money to spend could also... So they lost touch with the community. That's what this was all about. This is releasing a game. They thought they checked all the boxes, good graphics, good sound, um, you know, a, a great option for battling, but completely lost the touch with what the community that plays these type of games actually wants. And mm-hmm. now it's now it's a mess. They could fix it, but you're not going to fix it with a suit here. You're going to fix it by bringing the players in and getting their suggestions on how to make this game work. Yeah. All right. Also in the news is uh, gaming news is Lord of Dwarves. So we love games that support Linux natively, but we really love games that support Linux and are made with open source tools. And Lord of the Dwarves checks both of those boxes. So this game is described as gather resources, craft weapons, and build castle. Then defend your castle against monsters, 
who will try to siege, sap, and smash their way in, as monsters often do. Naturally. All in a procedurally generated 3D block world that allows to extensive crafting and total construction and destruction of the terrain. The game is currently in early access. It appears to be a hybrid of kind of like a castle defense game to me meets Minecraft. That's kind of what it looked like mm -hmm. in the playing. Mm -hmm. One of the things is the game's nineteen dollars, so you know a lot of us like to wait for Steam sales for things to be three or four bucks, depending if it's you know nineteen dollars is not bad for a game, but it has to be really something that's in my genre, and I'm not a big tower defense person or Minecraft person, so I wasn't willing to spend the nineteen dollars. But that's not to mean that it's not worth every single penny of that nineteen dollars if you're into those type of games. So anybody else take a look at this one? And yeah, I think it's actually pretty interesting, and I think that the uh, the idea of it is is interesting because of the like the tower defense is usually like here's the things that you have uh, available to you to use in this game, whereas in this one is here's the ability for you to build whatever you want to build for your castle or for whatever you're wanting. Like that's mm -hmm. a cool concept. Yeah. And Strangely enough, Ryan, the thing that I liked about this is it oh. had elements of the game risk about it. Mm -hmm. Because if you just went blindly along your way and you built up your wonderful community and you put all these farms and fences and all the rest of it, the monsters have come along and have merry hell. So you've actually got to think about, no, hang on, I need a boundary wall. Let's see if that can keep them out. I need to do this. And you can actually split up your actual resources to say what well, these are the guys who are going to go off and go and get all the wood these are the guys who are going to go off and hack away at the foundations yeah. and start building these brick walls so it's it's not just a simple blocky not very good graphical i don't think the graphics on this matter as much because it's actually quite gratifying to see this big blocky wall being built up and in your mind you're going yeah get through them monsters if you can um so it's, it's, it was a multifaceted game. You could make it almost like a Farmville type thing. You're building up this community. Mm -hmm. Another side of it is, well, no, hang on it, because you've got to defend yourself against all these other bits and pieces coming through. So for me, I thought that was, that was quite good. Yeah. Awesome. What have you done with Zeb? And we want our original Zeb back, <laughs> right? I was about to say, like, okay, so we, what we learned about this is that uh, Zeb does not like pixels, but he does love voxels. So that's good. <laughs> yes. And strategy. He's, he right. threw risk in there, which are, if you're a big risk player, we might have to do war in self, Zeb, because I love risk and I'm really good at it. And and red alert and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Was, I loved playing those. Types I will of totally play those too. And I am trash. <laughs> so I look forward well, I to you're really good at it, but you know, it's just to get everybody amped up. <laughs> As Linux gaming continues to grow, thanks to advances like Steam, Proton's ways to manage your game library are becoming more important. Now, a lot of people have probably heard of Lutris. I actually had a chance to meet up with Lutris and chat with them uh, last week at Scale. Um, Lutris is essentially a game management tool that we've covered in the past um, that allows you to essentially get games to work on Linux, whether or not they're natively designed to. There's another one called Game Hub. Now, the supported platforms are Steam, uh, GOG, Humble Bundle, and Humble Trove. Once uh, once you add one of these platforms or services into Game Hub, it shows you all of the games for these platforms. You can mix games from different sources. You can filter by specific service. Some find Lutris to be a powerful tool, but it isn't the most user-friendly. Game Hub is a more simple interface to navigate and manage these various sources. So what do you guys think about this? So I totally dug this. I, I love Lutris. I, I remember bringing it to the show. I remember talking about it when it dropped on my personal channel and was super excited about it and still am. With that said, sometimes I'm on a machine where I don't need all that Lutris has. I just want something to interface really quickly with my GOG library, for instance, and my Steam library where I can just go to one place to pull them up. And it's just a menu with my games. It doesn't really do anything else. Uh, except you know, allow me to install them there and launch them from there. And that's kind of what Game Hub does. So I wouldn't say it's as good as or a replacement for Lutris. It is those things that's another alternative if you're not looking for something with all the features and menus and ways you can get lost in Lutris, which is what we love about Lutris. But not everybody needs all that, right? They just yeah. want to launch the games that they have and play them. And I think Game Hub does a great job of that. It's also mm. a good option because uh, GOG doesn't have their own um, client for Linux. So if you were to have GOG games, you're not going to get that same benefit as like a Steam client where you can get the library in the same application. GOG's application it is not supported on Linux for some reason. Uh, but this is allowed, a good option to 
uh, give you a solution for that as well as the other ones is what like you know just to have like a, a, a single place for multiple games but it definitely does provide a ton of benefits for humble bundle and gog uh, humble bundle doesn't even have their own client and gog doesn't work on linux so it's like a good solution there uh, lutris is awesome too uh, with its own like custom recipe system like that's really cool but those that's it's they're, they're kind of in the, a different uh, a different genre of function one is to make it easier to get applications uh, you know, to installed in a game so you, so you can, and whereas the other one is more of to manage what you already have. So I think, I think they, they, they both have uh, a lot of good benefits as well. Mm -hmm. And the thing I like about this is it's just another example of the world waking up to gaming on Linux. And it's just another way for people who are on windows and don't want to go to windows 10, they're on windows seven Okay, so they've got Steam and they've got GOG and they've got Humble Bundle and you know all the other Lutris and and now they've got Game Hub. And the more people that start thinking about we can get our gamers onto Linux, the better it's going to be for everybody. Yeah, well and, said, what Zeb? Yep, yeah, and Linux will solve every issue, right? It, to me, it's sloppy silliness for companies like GOG not to have uh, the option to have a store on Linux like yep. a Steam. It's just stupid. It, it's and I love GOG. I think they make great, but that I end up using Steam more just for that very reason. They don't have a native client. I don't want to mm -hmm. log in through the website and try to find the game, download it, and do all that junk. I, I want a client. They should have one. Linux community comes in and is like, mm, okay, we got this, and fixes it. This is what Linux people <laughs> do all the time. Exactly. Nice. So on to our tip and trick of the week. So I wanted to bring hard info hard info tool uh, into the spotlight or tip and trick, because this is a really cool system profiler and benchmark tool that you can utilize. It offers the ability to get information on every part of your system from the hardware to the sensors and even the kernel that you're using. You can run benchmarks on this tool as well. It has built in benchmarks for your GPU, CPU, and things like floating point benchmarks. If you want to run those, you can generate reports and even get a view of the users and groups that you have enabled on the system. It's a great tool for your for your toolbox, uh, whether you're troubleshooting something like a GPU, CPU, or just like me where you forget what hardware did I install on this computer six months ago. A uh, great and simple way to get that information very easily. So if you haven't yet, there are a lot of great entries in this realm, right, of system profiling tools. But Hard Info is a really cool one to check out if you're looking for something new. All right, so a big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us, for watching, listening to Destination Linux. We love our patrons and Kofi supporters, so we just want to give a special shout out to all of you for your continued support. We do a live show for our patrons, so come join us if you want to be a part of the show. You can join for just one dollar. I don't even think you can get a candy bowl anymore for a dollar, like out of one of those vending machines. So it's darn near free. You should join, come join us, come hang out with us after the show and have a great time. That's right. We have two methods to become a patron. That's worded very strangely because it's not a patron. It's also a coffee supporter. Hold which on, is hold on, hold on. The word patron is not exclusive to Patreon. Okay. It, is, it is to become a patron, not ha, a patron. Got you, Mr. Irregardless. Whatever, whatever you say, Michael. So feel free to start, start again, start again, and then say it properly. All right. <laughs> Go back to wow. school, dude. That's right. We have. <laughs> that's right. We have two methods to become a patron, which is not exclusive to Patreon, even though everybody's going to associate it with Patreon. So we're going to call it a patron. But it can also be for coffee. Now, coffee is the proper way to pronounce coffee, and it's another way that you can support the show. Now, coffee offers a nice monthly option that will let you have the same perks as Patreon, not to be confused with patrons, which is not right. exclusive to Patreon. But there will be a link in the show notes to how you become a patron on coffee, just like there will be a link to become a patron patron on patreon and we don't want to be confusing at all so i agree that's why we're going to interchange those terms so the perks includes things like access to the live shows under the version of the show so you can get the absolute worst show for the most money <laughs> <laughs> what? dang noah dang you the pair of you just got double trolled in oh my god the wrath of noah is strong man and just <laughs> off the cuff like ah wow that was beautiful, Noah. I, I, I know. I mean, I'm going to take that beating and enjoy it because yeah. that was beautiful. 
And moving on to the next subject, if you want to see more of that, let us know in your comments, on the video, in an email, on our Telegram groups, Discord, Twitter, Mastodon. Upvote Noah's double trollback of Michael and <laughs> Ryan. Let us know who thought that was just amazing. But seriously, keep those emails coming. They do make an integral part of the show, and they are fantastic reading every week. So send your comments through to comments at destinationlinux.org and also visit destinationlinux.org forward slash contact to be able to get um, other ways that you can communicate with us here at Destination Linux. That's right. And the, the fun doesn't stop right here. We actually have our own content or our own channels. You can find Ryan by going to youtube.com slash dosgeek where you can t check out his videos uh, regarding the Radeon 7 or his new ridiculously huge uh, heat sink that he got for his computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can fill your brains. Fill your brains, exactly. Yeah. You can also check out Zeb where he destroys a bunch of caravans on Euro Truck Simulators for his streams by going to youtube.com slash Zebedee Boss. Um, you can also find uh, my content at tuxdigital.com where I to cover This Week in Linux and um, a variety of different Linux-based videos. You can also check out Noah on his Ask Noah show, where he covers, uh, it's a call-in show where you can ask questions about business, tech, or Linux in general, and all, all kinds of different things like that for our, our different channels. And so we haven't brought, brought, we haven't brought this up. If you're watching the video, have you checked out the, t the screen behind uh, Ryan? I just really love the fact that every once in a while, it just randomly says, by the way, I use Arch. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome this is using screenly in the background by the way we'll talk about it on another episode but yeah it's using screenly to through a raspberry pi to basically uh cast different images and things including it can do video to that tv there nice so everybody remember to like that smash button and also share the show on social media all right everybody have a great week and remember the journey itself is just as important as the destination thanks everyone Bye-bye. Bye-bye.